Fourth assignment, guys, is going to be about a second order autoregressive process. Now, second order autoregressive process is looking like this. I mean, you have a constant, which you're supposed to have a constant in your regression. In this case, it's going to be important, guys, because that affects the, basically the matrix of predictors. You're going to see that later on. So the matrix of predictors is going to be important. The multiple regression. Now, there is going to be one explanatory variable at the beginning. This is going to be y t minus 1. So this is basically the observation at time point t minus 1. So the previous observation. And then basically the day before, if there's daily observations. OK, and there is a noise. Again, this is basically explained here. So y t is the observation at time point t. This is the response. And then yt minus 1 is the observation at time point t minus 1. And yt minus 2 is the observation at time point t minus 2. So you have basically two, in this case, two explanatory variables having a direct impact on a current observation. So let's say time point t is a current observation. And then time point t minus 1 is going to be the time point for the observation at time point t minus 1, so the previous one, as well as the one before. And these observations do have a direct impact on the current observation both. So this is a second order autoregressive process, as you might guess, second order, because you go back two steps in time. That's, and then and it's over. Okay, so this is the direct impact. Now, this requires a multiple linear regression. There is also a way to do OLS regression in this case. I haven't done this in the lecture, but I'm going to talk about that. So how does that would work? Okay, so you have basically capital T observation regarding the series. So the series has capital T observations. Okay, but not basically the, I mean, not the predictors, it's not basically the response, as you might guess. Okay, I send you basically the, one of the solutions to your second assignment where you would figure out, you know, how many observation pairs there are. Okay, now, okay, in this case, there are triplets or triples in this case. Okay, so you have one response, two exponential variables, and of course, there's going to be the constant as well. But anyways, okay, so this is what it's going to be. Now, we assume that the noise is... IID in this case, to make it easier with zero mean and constant variance. But that's what it's going to be. It can be normal, especially when you do, I mean, when we do the t-testing, okay, which you would need to do also on this assignment, you would need to assume, I mean, we are going to assume that the noises are normal. So then therefore the test statistics that are involved, the t-test statistics are going to follow the t-distribution. Okay, but you need to figure out how many degrees of freedom basically. Anyways. Okay, so let me talk about the multiple linear regression in general. So this is basically how to, how to express it. There is two ways to give basically information about that. One of them involves the vector notation and the other one basically is the matrix notation. It might be convenient for you to be familiar with the matrix notation, but I'm going to introduce you to the vector notation also. So there is a linear model in the vector notation, guys. So these are not, I mean, okay, this is not a vector. This is an observation at time point i, or let's say, I mean, we don't necessarily have time series, but let's say it, at point i for the response. And uh, in this case, there is a vector product. Now, in this context, guys, capital T in exponent means transposition. Okay, so this is a transposition. I think you know what the transposition is. If you have a basically a matrix, okay, so let's say one, two, three, or maybe I'm going to write it like this. So you have one, two, three, four, five, and six, and you transpose the matrix, then you put basically the entries of the first column, which is one, two, and three, into the first row of the transpose, and then you have four, five, and six, okay, and this basically yields the transpose here of the matrix that is involved. Okay, now X is a vector, okay, so that is going to be a row vector if it's transposed, because if I say vector, I mean always mean column vector. Okay, so XI is a column vector, so XI T, which is the transpose of that, is going to be a row vector. And this is a vector of parameters which are called beta in this case. Okay, so you're going to see this. Maybe you're more, com I mean, you're more familiar with the notation regarding matrices. Now, this is the noise at basically at i. So at point i, basically, I mean, it can be series, but it's not necessarily the case. And you can estimate that basically using all this as well. I'm going to introduce you to that. So this is the i error. Again, this is the vector of parameters. Now, again, so anytime I say vector in this context, I always mean a column vector. 
So this means this is, of course, this is a column vector. If you transpose a row vector, then you're gonna get a column vector as well. There are k entries, okay? So the number of parameters that is involved here directly is equal to k plus the variance of the noise. So this is actually k plus one, but the parameter vector contains k entries. Now, this is basically what the vector, uh, this is the vector that you would need to estimate also. Okay, yi is basically the i-th observation of the response, of course, and xit, which is interesting here. This is actually, and you will see this later on, this is the i-th row, okay, of the design matrix. So that is going to be the i-th row of basically of x. And X is the design matrix. Let me give you that one so that this is something that you would, you're probably more familiar with because you have seen, you might have seen multiple regression models. Okay, the first column is consisting of ones, and then you have basically every single other predictor given in columns or observations of basically in columns. So for basically for for the second one, I mean, the, the, the first column counts also. This is going to be x12, which is the first observation of the first explanatory variable, which is expressed by x2. This is x22, which is a second observation of the same explanatory variable, and so on. And then you have xn2, which is the nth observation of the same explanatory variable. And there is a last column. And of course, I mean, there are columns between or in general, and then you have k columns. Okay, so this is basically x. 1k, which is the first observation of the exponential role xk, x2k, and so on. And the last one is going to be xnk. So n is the basically the row index, and k is the column index. You might be familiar with when it comes to measures. So this is called the design matrix. And xit down there, xit is going to be its ith row. So this is here, guys. This is it. Okay, this is, let's say, the second one. This is X2 transpose, basically. So you go down, okay, each column, and that's what it's going to be. You'll see that later on. Okay, so I'm going to give you that one, but this is basically the i-th observation to all the predictors there are, including basically the first column, which is consisting of one. So keep in mind, you don't say that the constant is a predictor, but actually it would be the case though, okay, in this regard, because the first column of the so-called design matrix is consisting of ones in general, if there is a constant in the regression, which is supposed to be here also. So this is what it's going to look like. Now you're probably more familiar with the matrix notation. Keep in mind guys, or I mean, these are vectors here. So N, uh, y, what, sorry, Y is an N by one vector. The noise is also an N by one vector. The parameter vector is of course a, uh, it has k entries, right? So this is going to be a k by one vector. And the design matrix is an n by k matrix, by the way. So this is how it would work. Okay, so these are the matrix. I mean, this is basically what is involved. And here you see basically the noises. Now, this is the, actually the vector containing the observations of the response. And down there, this is the so-called design matrix, as I've told you before. It consists of basically of the observation. So each column denotes a set of observations to a predictor and uh, it has k predictors. So that means that it has k columns, of course, and each, each column you'll find an observation to the given predictor. So this is how data is listed, by the way. So when you look at data, when you open an Excel file, in general, in every column you have the variables or the observations to that variable listed and not in rows. So this is basically consistent with, uh, with uh, the applications, by the way, okay? I'm not sure if you understand this, but maybe you can put that together, okay? So when it comes to the regression, okay? And that's what you would need to do. The design matrix, again, if there is a constant in the regression, which there will be in a second order autoregressive process, you would need to have that, then the first column always consists of ones, okay? So that's basically how it goes. Because, you know, and if that's not the case, then this will be not consistent with it. Okay, so the first column consists of ones. Here you go in the design matrix. That's always the case. All right, so there is, even if this is a simple linear regression, if you use that notation, the matrix X, the design matrix, has at least two columns. And the first column is basically consisting of ones. This is how it will be. 
And one of your goals is going to be, if you have the data, which you do, so I'm going to give you the same data, you would need to establish the design matrix among others. So I want to know which matrix to use basically for calculations. And you're, let me say this, the first column of that matrix is going to consist of ones and ones only. You need to know how many observations there are. So that's basically one of the tasks. Okay, so how many rows the design matrix will have. This is not convenient, guys, okay, because you, you have seen that the series has 11 observations, but the question would be how many rows the design matrix would have. If there is a second order autoregressive process here, we need to estimate. You need to make sure what these observations are regarding the predictors. Again, the first column consists of ones, by the way. But that's something that you would need to think about. And that is also part of the second, or that was actually also part of the, I can recall it, Kirk. No, that was part of the third assignment, which I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to evaluate also, okay, in the weekend. You got a question? Uh, yes. Um, when it comes to the circle in your yes. model, as we did it in yeah. the previous assignment, yes. uh, there were 11 observations. Yes. And we had only 10 responses, right? Mm, actually, yes. So there are, uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. That was, and that was a solution, yes. That was 10 observation pairs in the regression. You understand? Because us, And now you need to think about if there is a second order autoregressive process, how many, it's not pairs because you have three. So there is one observation to the response and two observations of the explanatory variables respectively. So there are three observations, it's a triple, right? So how many triples there are? And that will be the number of rows of the design matrix. And you need to think about Okay, so how many rows the design matrix would have? It's not going to be 11, let me say this. And it's not going to be 10 either, in this case, because you have two exponential variables and it's a second order autoregressive process. Okay, you need to think about that. So I, wanna, I want you to establish your design matrix that you consider for regression using the same data as for assignment three, if that's your question. All right, I want you to think about that. So then, of course, this affects the you know, degrees of freedom also. Okay, so how many degrees of freedom are there? Again, so it depends on the number of observations of each predictor. And the number of observations of each predictor corresponds to the number of rows that the design matrix will have. And I want, I want to know how many there are. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? That's, that's crucial, guys. So spend, let's say, at least 10 minutes on, if you're not sure, spend at least you know at least 10 minutes on thinking about how to okay so what what is involved because that's the most important this is where you start yes um, but at least when it comes to the simple of linear regression model the number of responses and predictors has to be the same yes of course because you need to have pairs of course all right of course that's true okay these are observation pairs right they're connected the two samples are connected if they're not connected, then you could not do a regression. You could not do even correlations. Understand what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense, by the way. So these observations are connected. I was posting a picture, I, I remember, maybe two or three days ago, okay, illustrating that. So how to establish, basically, these observation pairs from a given series if there is a first-order autoregressive process which is involved, okay, which it is, by the way. That's something that you, you need to look at. All right, is it clear? So I, I, I know it's difficult, guys, but I want you to think about it. It's not just, but after that, when you establish it, it's going to be straightforward. Yes. And one last question. Um, when it comes to calculating the variances, yes. um, should we use the sample variance? I'm going to tell you what to use. So here, uh, I'm going to give you an explicit formula for the standard error of the regression, among others. So you'll see how this goes. But this is not how it works. So within the multiple regression, it's going to be different. Different. Let me explain at least the equations first, because I'm going to derive them, by the way. So you'll see how this is. So let's call basically the estimator of beta, which is a parameter vector this time. Let's call it beta hat. It can be all S estimation. There are, there are different ones. Method of moments estimation, even the maximum likelihood estimation, if you assume the noises to be normal, which is you know resulting in a maximum likelihood estimation. There is a GLS, generalized least squares. There is a generalized method of moments. So there are, there are lots and lots of linear estimators, uh, estimator, by the way. One of them is OLS. And then 
I'm not going to discuss the other. This is another topic, by the way. But uh, this is something that you would need. You would. I'm going to define it, by the way. So I haven't defined defined the LS estimation in general terms, which I did in a simple linear regression, but in the general terms. Now the fitted values are going to be calculated from a matrix product, guys. So keep in mind this is a matrix product. Again, the design matrix is an n by k matrix. And this vector is, of course, a k by 1 vector. So if you multiply the two, this is going to be an n by 1 matrix or an n by 1 vector, vector as, as you might guess. Okay, so this is a matrix, matrix product, guys, not a regular product. So keep that in mind. You know how to multiply matrices. You seem kind of lost, by the way. I apologize, but you're kind of wondering. Okay, so I hope you, you know how to, you to multiply two matrices, all right? So that's going to be there. We're going to look at that. Now, the residuals are the differences actually between the observed values or the, of the response and its fitted values. So that's not nothing else, nothing new, which is going to be given by this formula. So whatever the estimation would be, this is going to be how you would calculate the residuals. You would need to, and then let me say this, you would need to provide me a sample of your residuals. Understand what I'm saying? So I'm going to basically, you know, expecting you to give me a sample of residuals because one issue within the multiple linear regression which is involved, you cannot calculate the coefficient determination from the correlations. That's not going to be possible directly, let's say. So as you might guess, you know, the, as I mean, you recognize this in the first assignment already, the square of the correlation coefficient would be equal to the coefficient determination within a simple linear regression model. However, this is not true within multiple linear regression model. One of the reasons because there is no correlation between three variables, guys. This is just only a binary operator, let's say in this regard. So there is just two variables, but in this case you have more, right? So there is no such thing as going to be correlations, but again, from the variance of the noise of, of the of the residuals if you basically divide the the variance the sample variance of the of the residuals not the corrected ones the sample variance of the residuals by the variance of the noises eh, sorry the other way around the variance of the of the residuals by the variance of the response empirical variance and subtract that from from one this is going to be the coefficient determination. So that's basically how you would do it. One minus the variance, the empirical variance of the residuals divided by the variance of the, respo of the response, okay? And you need to have the residuals for that. There is no way around that. So you would need to provide me a sample of this or that. You understand what I'm saying? That, but that's co that this is corresponding to the simple linear regression, except for the fact that for a simple linear regression, you can bypass this approach by using correlations. Okay, so check out how I did it and that's exactly the way you would need to do it as well. This is the formula giving you the residuals. Okay, so as soon as you got the estimation, you can directly calculate the residuals here from this regression. Okay, but keep in mind, you need to be very careful regarding matrices. Again, in this case, this is an exception, guys. So assignment four, you can submit an Excel file where you just simply list your solutions. So then I see how you are calculating things because you would need to calculate matrix products using Excel. And I'm going to show you how to, okay? This, is, this assignment cannot be solved by a regular statistic, statistical software where you simply just estimate the AR2 process because I want you to understand how, to, how these things are uh, basically are calculated. What you can do, I'm allowing you to do this, you can check your results for accuracy using a software. But I want you to basically calculate this using a big calculator, which is Excel, by the way, so to be honest. Because then I want, I want to check whether you understand, you know, this, this approach or not. Now, the sum of the squared residuals, okay, which as you have seen, is literally the sum of the squared residuals, right? There are n of them because the number of observations of the response, let's say, would correspond to the number of rows of the design matrix, and that would be also true for the residuals as well. Okay, so there are n of them. You need to square each, and then you would need to sum that up, and then you would have the sum of the squared residuals, by the way. 
or a residual sum of squares, RSS. You talked about that. Now there is a matrix notation for this. You take basically the vector containing the residuals, transpose them, and then you multiply them by the residuals. Keep in mind, the residuals and this vector is an n by one vector. And if you transpose it, of course, this becomes a one by n vector. So if you multiply a one by n vector by an n by one vector, you're going to get a one by one expression, which is a scalar, by the way, obviously. The sum of the squared residuals must be a scalar. But this is actually how you would do it, okay? You can plug in the formula for the residuals here. So I take that, put that in, which is going to yield the fitted, I mean, y minus the fitted values. And then you transpose it, of course, and this is what you do also here. And if you, guys, you, you can use basically matrix multiplications as regular ones, but if there is a transposition involved, you need to consider that one. Let me explain this. Okay, so if you expand this expression, you have y, y transpose times y, that's the first one, okay? This is a scalar also, by the way. So if you multiply a column vector by its, or pre-multiply a column vector by its transpose, you're always gonna get a scalar. This is a one by one matrix, by the way. A one by one matrix is a scalar by definition. All right, so that's basically what it's going to be. Now, this, this comes twice, okay? So you need to multiply y by, um, I mean, the green expressions and the, the yellow expressions. Okay, and don't forget the transposition. So take always the transposition simply. You can ignore it for a moment, but then after that you would simply take it. Now, if you want to break in into the transpose of a matrix product, you simply would need to reverse the order. So this becomes B transpose times A transpose. The transpose of a product is equal to the product of the transposes, but within a different order, guys. Okay, so this is what it's going to be. All right, so this is how you break in and you find this expression there twice because the products with the green ones are equal to the products to the, the, the yellow ones. Why? Because both are one by one scalars and a transpose of a scalar is of course equal to the scalar itself. You understand what I'm saying? So it doesn't really matter what, what comes out here in this regard, even though the order is different. Because if you take it, take it transpose, this is what it's going to be. So you have this expression there twice. And then you have this expression there. I mean, I put that together. Don't ignore the transpositions. Okay, so it says literally x times beta transpose is multiplied by x times beta, which is true. But if you want to break into these brackets, you would need to reverse the order. So this becomes beta transpose times x transpose. And then you can simply just take that, which you see down there. You understand what I'm saying? So this is how to break into the matrix transpositions inside basically of matrix products. If you, do, if you follow this approach, nothing can happen to you. Now, the reason why I was expanding that is because I want to calculate the OLS estimator from this expression. And this is very, very practical when you follow the matrix approach because the definition of OLS estimation is going to be, and when you look at that, you take the sum of the squared residuals and then you choose the parameter vector that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals by definition. We're looking for the smallest, I mean, the, so the residuals are measuring the distances between the observation of the response to the regression equation. It's, it's not, you can call it regression line, but it's a multiple regression. So you have a higher dimensional, hyper, hyper space. That's how it's called. Okay. But you don't need to know this. This is basically what the regression equation would be. Okay. And you would need to find the estimator that minimizes the sum of the squared residuals because the sum of the squared residuals need to become as small as possible. All right, so, and this involves a, make a minimization problem. So you need to basically take the sum of the squared residuals and minimize that with respect to the parameter beta. Now, this involves matrix differentiation. Matrix differentiation is basically differentiation of multidimensional functions. If you can write it like this, okay, so del RSS, you consider Partial differentiation, guys. So in mathematics, I don't know who was teaching you that, but partial differentiations. You calculate the gradient. You know what the gradient is? The gradient is basically the vector containing the first derivative of a matrix. There are going to be k of them. So if you write it like this, okay, so this is what it's going to be. This is the gradient. This is the gradient of the objective function RSS with respect to 
beta, of course, and this is going to be a k by one vector, by the way. All right, because the gradient is always a vector if you have a multi-dimensional function, depending on k variables. And if you differentiate that, this is going to be higher practical. You're going to get a vector, by the way. So you need to differentiate basically with, with respect to every single parameter that the parameter vector has, and there is going to be k of them. Now I'm going to teach you how, how to. So this is not going to be an issue, guys. You can simply ignore, I mean, if you use the OLS estimation, right? This must be zero. This is the first order necessary condition for optimization. Let me write it down. So first order necessary condition, okay? For optimization is that, of course, that the first derivative of the function must be equal to zero. And it's not the first derivative, it's the gradient of the function. So the gradient of the function must be equal to zero. Understand that, guys, okay? I mean, I'm not gonna consider the second order differentiation. Now, how would you differentiate that expression with respect to beta? It's simple, okay? So from the practical perspective, ignore that these are matrix products, guys, okay? Ignore that for a fact. Just pretend that you would have something like this, like y squared minus two times beta times x squared plus beta squared x squared, okay? It's not that, but let's pretend that for a moment, okay? If you're differentiating that stuff, okay, with respect to beta, of course, then this becomes, okay, y squared is going to be zero. You know why? Because it doesn't depend on beta. So anything that doesn't depend on data, beta is the root is going to be zero. Two times beta times x squared becomes minus two times beta times, no, sorry, two, two times x squared. This is what it's going to be, right? You understand? And this becomes plus two times beta times x squared. That's it, okay? And then you put back the, made, the transpositions and all that stuff. You understand what I'm saying? This is it. So just pretend that this is just like, you know, regular types of variables and all that stuff that you're used to. Ignore for, ignore for the fact that this is basically matrices involved and then put back the transposition signs and whatnot, okay? If you want get, if you get rid of the basic differentiation, you get rid of the transposes. So let's say you would get rid of the transposes and that is, this is, this is going to be the derivative, okay? So here you're going to have zeros. There it is. This is it, all right? And this is what I'm going to write it down. So that's, but you don't, you don't need to do this, by the way, all right? So this is going to be the derivative of the objective function RSS, and then you need to put in the OLS estimation. And this must be zero by definition, of course, because the OLS estimator minimizes the residual sum of squares. All right, that's, but that, 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 that is going to be his definition. All right? So, yeah, and how would you solve this equation? I mean, this must be equal to zero. How would you solve this equation for beta? Now, the first thing that you can do is you can divide by two on both sides and bring this expression to the, to the right-hand side of the equation. And that's going to be what I'm doing. Okay, so here you're going to see that. Okay, so this expression is going to be staying on the left-hand side. Again, after I divide it by two, okay? I'm going to get rid of that and then the other one is going to be seen on the other side of the equation and that is going to be it. Now, if you want to solve this for, for, for beta, which is the OLS estimator, you would need to pre-multiply both, both sides by the inverse of the matrix x transpose times x, basically, okay? So you would need to make sure that this matrix is invertible. You can assume that the rank, I mean, the assumption basically behind that is going to be that the rank of x is actually equal to k, all right, which is not greater than n, of course, okay? So if this is the case, then the matrix x transpose times x is going to be positive definite, and if it's going to be positive definite, then this matrix is going to be invertible, so you don't need to basically take, worry about that, okay? All right, so apologize, guys. All right, so that's what is what is going to be. now. This is the inverse, so you multiply on both sides and that's going to be the equation. Okay, so this is the OLS estimation. So there is matrices involved in this case, and that's what you would need to basically to implement, guys. The only thing that this requires is the design matrix and the vector of the response, and that's it. Because as soon as you got that, you can do matrix products. I'm going to teach you how to implement matrix products with Excel. Okay, so you don't need to use your hands, all right? So you can simply just submit basically 
a file. Okay, but that's the equation. So now, okay, so you would need to estimate those parameters. Okay, these are the parameters that you would need to estimate. Okay, I mean from a second order autoregressive model. Okay, using multiple linear regression by OLS, of course. Okay, so OLS is going to be the estimation. So again, you need to find the design matrix and you need to have also the vector of the response. And as soon as you got that, the formula that you implement basically containing the parameter vectors, which are going to be like this. So it's going to be V, A1, and A2, okay, inside. I mean, of course, again, this is a column vector. So if I write it like a row vector, you would need to transpose it. This is basically the vector, okay, containing the OLS estimators. Okay, so it's going to be a three by one vector, by the way. Okay, so this is a three by one vector that you would need to find using the equation basically which is x transpose times x to the power of minus one times x transpose times y okay so this is the equation uh, it was there you don't need to write it down again so it was on the slide which i give it to you all right now the same sample as in the, in your previous assignment guys okay so again this was a series i think you know how this works okay so take that okay this has 11 so the series itself all right, has 11 as, as observations, but I want you to think about how many observations, basically the predictors as well as the response would have that is considered for the multiple regression. Okay, so if I say, I mean, it's not that wrong if you say that the response has 11 observations in your previous assignment, which is basically the series itself, but not every 11 observation is considered for the response. You understand what I'm saying? There, in the, in the first order autoregressive model, there were just 10 observations which were considered. All right, so that was basically the idea behind that because there is just 10 observation pairs within a simple linear regression. But in this case, okay, it's not going to be 10 and it's not going to be 11. So I want you to figure out how many observations are going to be considered in this context. All right, now again, so let's continue. Okay, so this, you know how this works. So I hope basically it's going to be clear. And then you would need to create matrix products and teach you how to. Okay, so if you're not sure how to work with Excel, how to calculate matrix products, so actually you're going to learn this for next week. Okay, this time, all right? I'm going to give you a little hint. So first off, I wanna have the design matrix. That's very important. But let me tell you this, the first column of the design matrix will have ones because you need to have a constant in your regression. All right, if you miss that part, I'll cut off some, uh, maybe I don't know how much, but I will cut off something from your score. Anyways, so I want to have the design matrix that you're going to work with. I want to have basically the, the vector containing the observations of the response. That's going to be number two. Number three is going to be the OLS estimator. Okay, now this requires a little matrix products. Okay, but again, I don't want you to use a software for that because that's going to be easy. You can check. I mean, so you can implement your, your, your model in, a, in an empirical software, but the goal of this assignment is for me making sure that you understand the procedure, the calculation procedure that is involved. Let's say you want to, you would have to implement the procedure using an R package. So you are implementing, let's say an R package or what a kind of package that is, estimating a second order autoregressive process from a sample. Okay, so that's what it's going to be. I want to have a sample of the residuals because you would need to calculate the sum of the squared residuals. Okay, so that's going to be the next part. Okay, so if you have to set residuals, you need to square them, and then you would need to sum them up to create the sum of the squared residuals, yes. For the multiplication of matrices, can we use this uh, m mold uh, Excel function? Yeah, yeah, you can use an Excel function. I'm going to, again, so I'm going to show you how to, so if you're not familiar with those, I'm going to show you how to multiply, let's say, two matrices using Excel, if you're not familiar with that. Maybe I, I'll also give you another ad additional video of doing it live, so then you can do step by step. It's not difficult at all. Okay, so you can use op open software for that. But there, of course, for matrix products or matrix inversion, right? This is also involved with transposition. You can use Excel functions. You are supposed to actually. Okay, so in this case, you are supposed to. All right. Now find the sum of the squared residuals, and after that, if you find that, you need to find the, the standard error of the regression. Now the standard error of regression, there is a formula for that, is going to be the sum of the squared residuals divided by the degrees of freedom, and the whole thing is going to be this, taking the square root of. So the square root of the residual sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom, which is going to look like this, okay? So you have 
the degree, degrees of freedom, bless you, is n minus k, okay? So n minus k is the degrees of freedom, n is the number of observations that is, that design or basically each predictor and each, I mean, the response would have. So this is the number of rows of the, of the design matrix, guys. And k is the number of predictors, which is the number of columns of the design matrix. And if you subtract it to, this is going to be the degrees of freedom. You need to find basically, I mean, in this case, k is going to be three. That should be clear. You understand what I'm saying? But n is going to be different, okay? It's not 10, it's not 11. You need to think about it, all right? So then n minus three is going to be the degrees of freedom because you have three parameters that you're estimating directly, right? The constant and the two slopes. You can call them slopes if you like. And this is basically the, the formula, for, and, and there is no way to bypass that using correlations. So you would need to have the sum of the squared residuals to get the standard error of the regression, okay? If the, let's say the sum of the squared residuals is wrong, then I'm going to check, I mean, that's why I wanna, wanna have it. I'm going to check your, your, your result, and I, I pretend, I assume that this is going to be the, the correct answer, so you're not gonna penalize twice just because the sum of the squared residuals is wrong. You understand you only get penalized once, not twice, okay? So, but I wanna have something. You understand it? So, anyways, good. Now, as soon as you got this, I want you to calculate this matrix here. This is the square of the standard error. This is the estimated variance, by the way. So it's square, it's equal to, and let me explain, this is equal to one minus, the, uh, one by the degrees of freedom times the sum of the square residuals, obviously. So you simply take the sum of the squared residuals and divide it by the degrees of freedom. This is going to be the variance estimator for the noise, all right, which is the unbiased one. And then I want you to multiply that by this matrix here. And the reason for that is, of course, because this expression will help you to get the standard errors of the, let's say, of these coefficients. So let's say for, for sake of an argument, I mean, this is not what it's going to be, but let's say this is going to be one, four, and nine, and then you have I don't know, maybe expressions like two, one, two, one, whatever. It's just going to be a symmetric matrix. So you have a symmetry involved. Okay, so this is what it's going to be. So this matrix is going to be a, a symmetrical matrix. Okay, and if you want to, let's say, get the standard error of the regression coefficients, which I call like this, okay, which is going to be that, the standard error. This is simple. You would need to find the, I mean, the formula is this, it's going to be the, the, the standard error of the regression. And then you take the, and this is what it's going to be, the jth entry on the main diagonal. So JJ means J throw and J column. So if it's the first, okay, if it's basically the, basically the, the standard error of the first parameter, then this is going to be the entry on in the first row and the first column of this matrix okay which is going to be equal to one in this case as you see because that's the entry there if you multiply the two this is what it's going to be you understand what i'm saying if you're looking for the second one okay so the standard error of the second one this is two two okay so second row second column what does it say second row second column this is going to be i mean you see four so you need to take the square root of that Understand what I'm saying? Because, you know, you can need to put it back. So, I apologize, guys. I've forgotten something. You will need to take the square roots here. That's, yeah, that's a formula. Okay, this is explained. So, whatever this matrix is, take the elements on the main diagonal, all right? Take the square roots of the main, of the elements of the main diagonal, and these square roots are going to be the standard errors of the parameters. You will need those because you would need to, to divide the parameter vector that you were estimating by these standard errors to get the test statistics. Understand what I'm saying? So this is how it works. Simple is, okay? It's explained down here. If you're not, under, not sure, you can look it up. So again, to find the standard errors, there are going to be three of them because you have three parameters, right? You need to take the square root of, of this matrix and on the main, you, you would only consider the main diagonal Okay, so you take the diagonal elements of that matrix here in uh, number seven. Okay, so this is basically point seven. So you take the main diagonal 
You know what the main diagonal of a matrix is? Okay, so it starts by on bottom left and it go, goes down to top right. That's the main diagonal. You take the square roots of each element on the main diagonal and the square roots of each element on the main diagonal is going to be or are going to be the standard errors respectively. Yes? Um, you said bottom left to top right. But yes, it's bottom left to top right. Yes. But when you draw it, you put top left to bottom right. Top left to bottom right. No, that's the, so top left to bottom right. So if you look at basically the diagonal, this is going to be one, two, and three. All right, so this is what I mean. Top left to bottom right. I was not saying that, apologize. Okay. And then you would need to take the square roots of each. Okay, so that's not going to be the, the standard errors. You need to take the square roots and then that, that's going to be the standard errors, respectively. Is it clear from the description? Yeah, you gotta. Number seven, I just want to be sure over this, uh... Parenthesis with the, to the power yeah. one. There is a square root, right? Yes. Okay. No, no, but not here. Not here. So not take here. that, take that first. Okay, you need to calculate this matrix. Okay? Mind you, okay, so there is a square. Now, take the elements on the main diagonal of the matrix. Okay? So take the main diagonals. The, the main diagonal, there is a one. Yeah. The elements and take the square roots of each element on the main diagonal respectively to get the standard errors of the parameters. This is what it's going to be. Is it clear, guys? So maybe we can do an example, all right? So if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm going to explain, okay? At least so let's say I do this matrix here, okay? So this one is, so sigma, sigma squared times x transpose times x to the power of minus one, which is the inverse, is let's say, for the sake of the argument, the main diagonal is uh, 4, 9, 25, okay? And the others, simply ignore them. These are the covariances, by the way. So inside the matrix, you have the covariances of each, I mean, the estimated covariances, but simply ignore them, okay? So let's say you have one here, two. It's going to be a symmetric matrix, of course, all right? So you can ignore this. All you care about is the main diagonal. Now, what is the standard error of the first estimator? The standard error of the first estimator is going to be the square root of 4, which is going to be 2. That's going to be the standard error. You understand what I'm saying? The standard error of the second parameter is going to be 3, and the standard error of the third parameter is going to be 5. If this is your result. You understand? So whatever is on the main diagonal, take its square root, and then this is going to be what you're looking for, okay? As far as the standard errors, because you need to take those and use that for divisions to calculate the test statistics based on that. You understand what I'm saying? So you take the, param the entries of the parameter vector and then the entries of the standard errors. So these are the standard errors, okay? And divide the estimators of the parameters of the parameter vectors respectively with its which respective standard error to get the corresponding test of the step. All right, which is going to be the the step number task number nine. So I want you to do hypothesis testing. Okay, assume that the re, the noises are normal. Okay, assume that, and uh, if you assume that the noises are normal, then you can basically make sure that the test statistics are going to follow the T distribution under the null hypothesis. And how many degrees of freedom? Degrees of freedom are N minus K. That's going to be the degrees of freedom. N is the number of rows of the design matrix, and K is the number of columns of the design matrix. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so you need to find the critical values to those test statistics. It's always going to be the same at the five percent level, of course. So that that's going to be the one minus. So if you look at that, the one minus half a half quanta of the T distribution with n minus k degrees of freedom. All right. If there is a simple linear regression, the design matrix has two columns: one for the constant, which is consisting of ones, and one for the exponential variable. It has two columns, so degrees of freedom is going to be n minus k, n minus two, right? 
But in this case, it has three columns because it's a multiple regression, so you have n minus three as the degrees of freedom. Is it clear? All right, so I want you to put those things together and that's going to be your next assignment. All right, so, and the final question is of course, the coefficient determination. I want you to get the coefficient determination, but you cannot do correlation coefficients this time. Correlation coefficients can only be used for calculating the coefficient determination within the simple, but not within the multiple linear regression model. All right, that's what it's going to do. I hope this is going to be clear by now. All right, guys, the submission deadline is going to be Friday, not this week. This is, today is the 17th. I think there is, an, yes, so to, tomorrow is the 17th, right? So one week after Friday, this is going to be a new. So I want you to submit an Excel file, guys, okay? That's easier, that's the easiest one. So you don't need to document it. Maybe you can write down that, okay, this is the, 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 the parameter vectors, this is the sample of residuals. Put that into the file, that will be fine. Okay, make sure that I can convert it because I don't have access. So maybe you can uh, submit an XLS file, not an XLX X file, but it doesn't matter. So if, I, if I'm having trouble converting your file because I'm not reading it, I, I cannot read it on my computer, then I will let you know, but I will, convert your file into an XLS file, if you don't mind, all right? It's going to be a simple calculation. Now, let me show you how to, because you might not know how these functions work, okay? So it's going to be, it's relatively easy. Every matrix function works the same way. It always starts by M, okay? So, so let's say this is, the, this is an Excel file. The, the, the yellow matrix is the one that you would wish to transpose. So you wanna, let's say you wanna calculate the transpose. Now, how to? Number one, select the area. If it's a three by two matrix, as you see, right? The transpose is going to be a two by three matrix. Understand what I'm saying? So you need to select some area somewhere in your file. It's, it can be, I mean, it, it doesn't ha have to be necessary down there. It can be also, you know, as you like. So put it somewhere if, if it's required. <laughs> you know, wherever you like to, but I want you to, I want to find it, guys, okay, so, because I, if I don't find it, I don't, you know, I cannot do anything with that, so, let's say you want to transpose something, that's it, so you select the area, you know how to select the area with Excel, huh? okay, maybe I can shoot a video, so explaining you that, and then you use the function mtrans, that's it, so type equals mtrans, m for matrix functions, and trans for not for transsexuals, transpositions, you understand? So put in, you know, and then you open a bracket and then you select, I mean, in this case, I got B1 to C, C3. So this is the matrix, B1 is here. This is the element of this cell and C3 is the element of this cell. Okay, so top left, bottom right, but not the main, this is not the main diagonal. So that identifies the matrix that you wish to transpose. That's step number two, all right? And then uh, you, t I mean, the, you need to push three buttons, okay? At the same, I mean, it's not necessary at the same time. This is shift, control, enter, okay? So keep that pressed. So you need both fingers, uh, both hands, okay? Because enter is on the right and shift and uh, control is on the left. Control uh, called in German, this is STRG maybe? Yeah, Steuerung if you have a German keyboard, all right? If you have an international keyboard, I think it's control, right? That's Steuerung, all right? So in German, Steuerung. I also do Steuerung because I have a German keyboard. So I put that. Three, I mean, three buttons you need to push. Them. I mean, then, and then it, it's going to appear. So this is the transpose of a matrix. There you have it. Then save your file, guys, save it, okay? So I don't need to tell you that one, all right? Okay, now, if you want to calculate the matrix product, keep in mind this matrix is a three by two matrix, and this is a two by one matrix, so the product is going to be a three by one matrix. You understand what I'm saying? So you need to make sure, you need to know how, how big these products are going to be if you calculate them. So you need to select an area somewhere, wherever you like to, okay? Basically, consisting of three rows and one column. Okay, whatever you like, so select the area. I mean, I put it down there, but you need to know how big it is in advance. If it's, you know, 
if it's if you make it smaller then it's not going to work sufficiently so yeah that's it and the, and the command is mmult okay so that's what you use okay type in equals mmult open the bracket and then put in the first matrix then you split it by semicolon so if you want to put in two matrices split it by semicolon which i did so you have it here you don't see this right but that's it and then you basically select the other matrix close the bracket and then press same shift control enter that's it okay and then you find a matrix product there you go okay so which i did all right so you can check it out whether this works i'm not sure if it does all right next okay and that is the inversion that's easy if it's a three by three matrix then of course uh, then of course its inverse is also going to be three by three matrix all right and uh, yeah, so select it somewhere, which you would need to, and then use the, use the function MINV, okay, matrix inversion, and that's how it goes, okay? So type in equals MINV, open the bracket, select the matrix that you wish to invert convert, completely, close the bracket, and then press Shift, Control, Enter, same thing, and then you'll have the inverse. I wish I had that in my student years, okay, which I didn't because I need to calculate the inversion by, by my hand, which, uh, which kind of sucked, but again, this is it, all right? Okay, so now then you can put those together. So you have the inverse, and, you know, I, I don't, you find it out for yourself. That's, that's, a, that's a task, all right? Yeah, and that's all you need. So this is what it was, guys. Is it clear how this works? It took me a long time to explain, but it don't mind, so... I'm going to basically at least you know you learn something how to how to do this this do these things and uh, so I want you to do the the regression by using Excel with your own hands okay not a software that bypasses it because my goal is I want to check whether you understand what is going on and you will never have to do it again in your life okay so. <laughs> But I want to I want to check whether you understand the point. All right. Anyways, yeah, that's this is what it was, and now I'm going to continue with the seventh lecture or, or with the remainder of it. <laughs> Let's see how how far we can get. All right, guys. I'm going to so just for you to know, I'm going to establish sta stationarity conditions for a first order autoregressive processes. This is going to be our topic. Last time, if you remember. Last time, there was a representation of first order autoregressive processes which I derived. And depending on the structure of time, there were two different ones. I'm going to consider each one one by one. So if you're not sure how to, or how would, would I basically derive those expressions again. So this was a starting point. And I thought, okay, maybe you, you might remember yt minus one equals the constant plus a times yt minus two and uh, plus the noise, and then you would substitute it for, for yt minus one, and then, you know, you do this. That was the first iteration, the second, the third, and so on. And uh, yeah, I did this basically n minus one times. So after that, basically, uh, when I was doing that, I was getting this expression. If you're not, not sure where this expression would come from, I would like you to check out a lecture six, which is, or has been already uploaded. So, but that, that's where we stopped, actually. I wanted to continue a little bit, but that's that's the expression that you saw. All right, now, it get, I take that and I'm going to develop two other expressions based on assumptions on time. Time, let's say if you have the coefficient which is less than equal to one or its absolute value which is less than equal to one, this makes sure that this thing would converge to zero, by the way, that would converge to zero if n is going to basically approaching infinity and then of course if n is going to be infinite then you have a finite weighted sum regarding the noises so if time is not bounded from below then of course this means that n can basically converge to infinity i mean it's, it's divergent but you know n is approaching infinity let's say so as as n progresses basically as you go back in time backwards okay so then the result or the expression that is going to yield is going to look as follows. Keep in mind, if the app that this requires that the absolute value of a is less than one, because if it's not, then this expression would not converge to zero. Okay, assuming that is going to be, let's say this is a constant almost surely, which you can, by the way, 
So, but then it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is what it's going to be. This expression, of course, will converge to zero. That's going to disappear, all right? This expression will converge to zero if the absolute value of A is less than one. And so that means that this thing will disappear, okay? The significance of that expression is, is going to disappear. It's not that straightforward because this requires, I mean, this is a random variable, guys, all right? But if you multiply a random variable by zero, it's going to be zero, technically speaking. So it's not that clean, mathematically speaking, but it doesn't really matter. It works in practice. And then you, you're left with basically with this sum, which is basically an infinite weighted sum of these noises. This is the expression that I'm going to use. And I'm going to start from here because this expression allows me, so the reason why I was doing that, okay, this expression, by the way, so forget about that, is this allows me to calculate expectations, variances, and so on. I want to check whether the process is going to be stationary, which is going to be the case, by the way. Okay, so if you do that, and which I'm going to show you how to, the expectation is going to be an expression that is not time dependent, by the way. So you have a constant mean. This is what it is. It is not going to be time. You don't see T here in this formula. You understand what I'm saying? So since you don't see T, expectation will not depend on T. You have mean stationarity, if you like. Then you have also variance stationarity, which is going to be this expression. This is going to be the variance of the process. And the outer covariance, which I'm also going to calculate. Somebody asked me how to last time. I'm going to answer now. Okay, so you see how it's calculated. It's going to be simply just a to the power of h times the variance of the process. And the variance of the process is here. Okay, so this is how it goes. All right, so this is going to be the autocovariance, and neither the expectation nor the variance nor the autocovariance are time dependent. If a process has these moments which are not time dependent, then the process is going to be called stationary in the weak sense. So if I say stationary, I always mean stationarity in the weak sense, not in the strong sense, because the strong sense involves cumulative distribution functions. But there, these are not practical, okay? So you could calculate basically the expectation, the variance, and the autocovariance, and so on, if I gave you these parameters. And uh, you will recognize that since it, none of these are time dependent, so they are time independent, of course. Since they are time independent, the process is going to be stationary. So this basically involves the stationary condition, which are two. Keep in mind, first, the absolute value of A is less than one. That's a first, okay? That is going to be a stationary condition. And a second is that time is not bounded from below, right? It's a metaphysical concept, by the way. So you have a metaphysical concept involved, basically yielding stationarity of a process. Because, um, let me tell you this, if time is bounded from below, this means that you could not go backwards infinitely far, then the process will not be stationary. Okay, so we have a metaphysical concept involved requiring basically to be true in order to establish stationarity of the process, which is not consistent with reality most of the time, because what does that mean? That you come back, you can go backwards infinitely far. No matter what kind of series you have, it always has started somewhere at some point. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, other, I mean, I'm not sure about that, but you know, I assume. So if you have a stock market, Price, stock prices of some companies and stuff. You know, there was an issue in price at some point somewhere. You know, so the company was not existing like, I don't know. You understand what I'm saying? So it was established at some point. Anyways, you understand? So this is going to be very difficult to, to deal with, by the way, from the theoretical perspective. In practice, we're, we're going to make it easier, but this is how, it go, how it's going to be. Now, I want you to understand how I was calculating these, these moments. And I'm going to start off by the expectation. The expectation is simply, I mean, this is the expression that I use, all right? So you put it in simply inside the expectation operator, and then you find that this involves a linear transformation of a random variable. Keep in mind, guys, the sum of random variables is a random variable, and then you add a constant to it. it and that, that is a linear transformation of a random variable. You have learned that the expectation of a linear transformation is equal to the linear transformation of the expectation. 
of the random variable. So if capital X is a random variable, that is so simply you can take out the constants from the expectation operator, which I'm going to do, even though they're kind of weird, but it doesn't matter. So I take the additive constant out from the expectation operator, and I'm left with the expectation of a sum. The expectation of a sum, on the other hand, is going to be the sum of the expectations, right? So make it simple. This means that you can bypass the sum operator by the expectation operator. Simple as. You can do that all the time, no matter what, okay? Which I'm going to. So as you see, this is going to be the constant plus the sum of the expectations. And inside the, the, the expectation operator, you also have a linear transformation of a random variable because keep in mind, the noises are random. So if the noises are random, then a times the noises are random, and a to the j is going to be also, I mean, a to the j times the random noise is going to be a linear transformation of that. And this allows you to take out the constant of the expectation operator, which I'm going to, because the expectation of a linear transformation is the linear transformation of the expectations. All right, so this is going to be the expectation of the noises, but the expectations of the noises are going to be zero, as you did basically in the second assignment. So yeah, which again, I was assuming the condition and expectation was zero, but this is what it's, what it's going to be as a consequence. So you have a sum of these zeros, which yields simply the constant. As you see, this is not going to be a time-dependent expression. This is the expectation of a first-order autoregressive process. Is it clear, guys? All right, now I'm going to also address the variance, which is a little bit more difficult because the variance of a linear transformation is not the linear transformation of the variance, but I'm going to see this here. The variance, you have the process, you should simply just plug it in. Now, you need to understand that the variance does not depend on additive constants. You understand? You can simply just dismiss A from the variance operator. You don't need to take care of that because that is going to be simply just the variance of B times X. Okay, the variance is measuring distances of a random variable to its mean, and if its mean is increased by a, which it does because if, if you increase it by a, then uh, the random variable itself, then the distance is going to be the same. All right, it's because a plus x minus in brackets a plus the mean is going to be x minus the mean, which is actually there. So the variance does not depend on additive constants. Simply just miss it from the variance operator. You can also do that from the using the covariance operator. By the way. And then, of course, the variance of a sum is going to be the sum of the variances if the noises are independent. And they are. Okay, we assume that. I mean, they're uncorrelated by, by definition. If, it, if it's not uncorrelated, then it's not going to be basically a noise. It doesn't need to be independent. But if you even assume IID noises, then there are. Anyways, the correlations, the autocorrelations are going to be zero. So in this regard, the variance of a sum is going to be the sum of the variances. Keep in mind, the variance of a sum is not the sum of the variances in general. This is the variance of basically, I mean, some of the variances, of course. But again, you might remember, this is plus two times a covariance. And uh, the, uh, the covariances are zero. So therefore, the sum of the variances, uh, the variance of the sum is going to be, sorry, the sum of the variances in this case. Now, the variance of a linear transformation, all right, is not the linear transformation of the variance, as you saw. This is b squared in this case times the variance of x. So this requires, if you want to get rid of this constant here from the variance operator, you would need to square it. And if you square it, a to the power of j to the second is going to be a, a to the power of two times j. If you take the power of a power, then you need to multiply the exponents. This is exactly what I'm going to do. And that's what I did actually. So you have a to the power of two times j. All right, this is basically the square of a to the j, so a raised by j, right? So this is it. And the variance of the noise is a constant, which we assumed, all right? So, okay, I'm running out of battery, I apologize. I forgot to charge it. Let's do that quick, maybe here. Okay, I hope it does work. Now, okay, so, and, and then I take sigma squared out from the sum. Okay, so because if you multiply every sum n by sigma squared, you can simply multiply the sum by sigma squared instead. So I take it out from the sum, okay? And the rest is going to be the geometric series. So this part is involving a geometric series, as you see. This is the formula that I use. It's convergent. Why is it convergent? Because the base has an absolute value, which is less than one. This, again, this is necessary to establish stationarity also, by the way because other than that, the variance would not be finite. So the variance needs to be finite, of course, which it is, right? And this expression is not time.
dependent, as you see. All right, that's um, obviously the case. Is it clear, guys? All right, now, let me say, tell you something. So, if I take this expression, I want to calculate future observations. I mean, first off, before I calculate the autocovariance, again, somebody asked me how to. I'm going to split the the observation regarding at time point t plus h into two parts because there are autocovariances or uh, there are noises that do overlap and there are noises who don't overlap and that's the reason if you substitute t by t plus h right then you need to do this at all at all spots here also okay so keep in mind this is the observation at time point t and so therefore this is the observation at time point t plus h and the only thing that is different is the time point t plus h so you would need to substitute t by t plus h this is it all right which i did understand what i'm saying now i'm going to in order to address the autocovariance later on which i'm going to i'm going to split this sum this sum is going to be split into two parts i'm going to split it into two parts the first part is going to be starting at point j and stopping at point h minus one that's going to be the first, okay? So this is what you're going to be, so two parts. And then I'm going to continue at point H and then plus infinity, all right? Now you might ask, why am I doing that? But do you understand the split, okay? So I split basically this range from J equal to zero to plus infinity into two parts, J equal to zero to H minus one, and the next one is going to be H. This is where you would continue. Now you might ask why, but I'm going to tell you why. Don't worry. So keep in mind, this is what you would do. Okay. Now the first part is going to be kept all the time and I'm going to rewrite that in different terms. Keep in mind, guys, I want you to understand what is going to be the first sum in. I mean, regarding the noises. So ignore a to the power of J because we're going to keep that one. The first sum end is going to be epsilon at time point T minus one. Do you see that? Because if J starts at H, right? So that's what we need to, I mean, no, not even that. Uh, epsilon T, there you go. Epsilon T is going to be the first sum end. I forgot. <laughs> so if J is equal to H, and then you would put it in here, you find you will have T plus H minus H, which is T. So that's going to be the first sum end. And the last, I mean, of course, this is how it goes, but how does it, how does it evolve? So if J is equal to H plus one, then this is going to be, the next one. So epsilon t is the first, epsilon t minus one is the second sum end, epsilon t minus uh, two is going to be the third, and so on, and each is going to be multiplied by a weight, which is resulting by a, a to the power of j, but that's it. Now, you can, if you, are, if you understand this, you can restructure the sum, okay? Because that would be the same as if you had that, that expression, all right? starting at time point, it basically, I mean, J at time point zero there. So people don't understand this, but let me explain. If you look at that one, what's going to be the first sum end? The first sum end is epsilon T. The second one is epsilon T minus one, and, and so on, epsilon T minus two, which is the same as for those, okay? The first sum end is epsilon T, the second is epsilon T minus one, and then the third is going to be epsilon t minus two, and so on. So you can simply just rename the summation index because that is consistent, but you need to be careful because, you know, a to the power of j becomes a to the power of j plus h after that, you know. So, I mean, you need to be consistent regarding the weights. But that's it. All right? This is it. And then you take out, and there is one final step, you can take out a to the power of h from the sum operator because a to the power of j plus h equals a to the power of h times a to the power of j. If you multiply two powers for which the base is the same, then you need to simply add the exponents. And since a to the power of h does not depend on j, which is a summation index, you can take it out from the sum operator, which I did. Okay, so I take it out and then I will have basically the same sum here. Now, the reason why I was splitting that is because I want to calculate the autocorrelation between yt and yt plus h. And I'm going to use those who overlap. So keep that in mind, guys. These sums, okay, all right, that one and that one are the same. You understand what I'm saying? So this involves basically the covariance of two random variables that are identical. One is multiplied by a to the power of h, but it don't matter. You understand? So that will be the variance involved. And these two, okay, so that one does not overlap with that one. 
There is no correlation between those because the noises are different. I'm going to explain later on. All right, so that's one step. Please, please allow me to do that. Okay, so I'm going to basically start from here. This is the autocovariance at time point t versus at time point t plus h, right? You simply just put him in here. This is, guys, what is true for the, for the variance is also true for the covariance when it comes to additive constants. You can simply ignore the additive constants, okay? Why? Because the covariance does not depend on them. All right, there is no significance regarding it. So take that, which is the first one, at time, this is going to be y t, at time point t, without loss of generality, and this expression is going to be basically the observation at time point t plus h without loss of generality taking out the constant. You understand what I'm saying? This is what it's going to be, all right, which I'm going to put in here. And uh, that's the first one, and that's going to be the second one. You see it, you see it up here. So again, if, you don't, if you're not sure where these expressions are coming from, this is here, all right, and uh, this expression is here. All right, so this is how you put them. And, and I ignore the additive constants because the covariance does not depend on them. You can simply just take them out, as I did for the various operator as well. All right, now, how to deal with that? Let me just basically do that one. These two, okay, are identical. I don't know if you rec recognize this. And what about that one in the middle? Because that is interesting. Now, you need to understand that there is no noise which touches one of the greens, all right? And the reason is because it's simple. I'm talking about the greens first because this is something that I want you to understand. The first observation, I mean, the first sum end is going to be epsilon. I, I ignore the, the, the a's, all right? So just ignore them. That is involved basically the, the noise at time point t, at time point t minus one and so on. And you go back infinitely far in time because, you know, there is no limit regarding it. Time is not bounded from below. You can go backwards infinitely far. You understand what I'm saying? So this is it, this is the greens. And now what about basically that expression, the purple ones? Oh, that's no, not purple, it's pink, but anyways. Mm -hmm. The first sum is going to be epsilon at time point t plus h. Why? If j is equal to zero, you can see that one here, all right? So this is basically, I mean, this is where you would start. Okay, but that's, that's not a point. Okay, this is what it's going to be, all right? So, and then, yeah, this is going to be the final expression. So they don't overlap with each other. And therefore the autocorrelation of the two is going to be zero. You can simply take it out. Why? And that's what is important, why? Okay, and the answer is, you might remember this theory. So the covariance of x plus y and x plus z is going to be equal to the variance of x if the random variables are pairwisely uncorrelated, okay? Okay, so if the random variables are pairwisely uncorrelated, okay, if they are pairwisely uncorrelated, then you basically, you can take, take out those that don't overlap with each other, okay? And that's exactly what I do. You understand? There is no correlation between that one and that one because the noises are parallelly uncorrelated. Why? Because they don't overlap with each other. That's the answer. All right? Good. Now, yeah, so you can take that multiplicative constant out from the covariance operator, and then you're left with the variance because the covariance of a random variable with itself is always going to be it's equal to its variance, okay, which I do. Okay, and the variance of that has already been calculated, which was one a sigma squared, times one by one minus a squared. And uh, yeah, so that was it. Okay, so that's the way basically to calculate the autocovariance or a first order autogressive process. And then you can use that approach even if time is not bounded from, I mean, if, if time is bounded from below. But in, the, in that case, that this is what it was. All right, now for the second case, which I'm going to do next week. So next lecture will be on Wednesday, guys. We're gonna have two lectures next week. We need to, I need to push this a little bit further. I'm going to assume, and that, that is what it's going to be, so let me just give you a little introduction. I'm going to assume that time is bounded from below, which is a different concept, right? Which is more consistent with reality in most cases, because again, if something is, is I mean, if it's a process that you observe right now, any process actually would have started at some point somewhere, all right? Okay, so this is more consistent with reality. 
you will find again so we, we have talked about the expression that is going to generate you'll find that if time is bounded from below then stationarity cannot be achieved unfortunately all right that's what it would be the lesson to learn so state the concept of stationarity regarding auto regressive processes will depend on assumptions about time okay which actually I cannot get rid of but this is a metaphysical concept by, by the way which is quite interesting and right so if the process is going to be stable but anyways what you also go, what you're going to have anyway is asymptotic stationarity that can be easily established and this is what I'm going to discuss next Wednesday okay so I'm going to interrupt it here I wasn't planning that I talk about the your next assignment that much but I was also deriving things so maybe that would compensate for that. You're going to learn a lot, by the way, if you solve this assignment. Okay, guys. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, don't forget your third assignment, which uh, the, for which a deadline is going to be tomorrow. Right? I think... No, no, there was no assignment. Oh, yeah. uh, that was my mistake. I'm talking to myself because I need to uh, correct your submissions. All right? I hope we'll make it until then. All right, guys? Okay, then uh, relax this week and then... Next Friday is going to be the deadline of the fourth assignment, guys. Take care. Thanks. Have a good day.